Okay, so I'd like to welcome Dr. Bill Brazelton from the Department of Geology, of, oops, Department of Biology. Um, his expertise is in genetics and cell biology and biological oceano oceanography and astrobiology. So, he works on microbial ecosystems and the diversity of life. And he has three projects a NASA project on astrobiology rock powered life, an IODP project, a drilling project essentially, investing the lost city as an ultra mafic urban center <laughs> um, of the sub seafloor in the mid Atlantic Ridge, and an NSF project looking at other mitigation and biophysical feedbacks in the changing Bonneville salt flats. And there he's integrating microbial diversity with geochemical and hydrological data. These are with Brenda. With Brenda, yes. So these are exciting uh, perspectives for those of us who think we are finding critters in rocks. So, welcome. Great, thanks for the introduction and thanks for inviting me. Um, so yes, I'm going to be talking about rock-powered life, and that is as opposed to sun-powered life, which describes basically all life on the planet, except for those that I'm going to be talking about today, and describes basically all life on the planet that we knew about until... So, so sun-powered life is on the surface, and I'm going to be talking about the subsurface, which I guess we're going into now. Sorry. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. uh, so things are happening. There's a lot happening. <laughs> 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 so even uh, life at the bottom of a sediment column on the seafloor is still almost entirely, or perhaps entirely, powered by the sun, because those microbes are just eating food that was made on the surface from the sun, and then it falls down to the seafloor, and then they decompose it. All right, so what I'm interested in are organisms that are completely powered by things other than the sun. So not only do they live in the subsurface, but all of their energy and food comes from the center of the earth or some part of the earth instead of the sun. So we didn't even know such a thing existed until relatively recently when we discovered hydrothermal vents. Hydrothermal vents were the locations of the first um, non-sun-powered life that we um, could prove was non, not powered by the sun. Um, and of course, especially to an audience like this, hydrothermal vents played a part in the, the big, uh, you know, it's a big geological discovery. But I think the discovery of hydrothermal vents was is a, a, such a huge scientific discovery because it's not only a big geological discovery and geochemical discovery, but it was a huge biological discovery. Um, and that's one of the reasons why I like this area of science so much. So we found out there were not only microbes, but giant animals living in these hydrothermal vents that are driving all of their food from chemicals coming out of the hydrothermal systems. They use hemoglobin to um, transport oxygen and sulfide into the microbes in their guts to make food. Um, there are giant clams that are doing something similar. Um, there are shrimp in the hydrothermal vents in the Atlantic Ocean that grow bacteria on their mouth parts and then eat this beard of bacteria as their, uh, as their sole food source. And this is a, an image of shrimp um, as they are in the wild, uh, competing for the prime spot right over the hot spring on the seafloor to have the best position to grow their, their beard of bacteria. One of my favorites is the Hasselhoff crab that has, uh, grows mats of bacteria on its hairy arms and then presumably eats the mats of bacteria, although they haven't um, quite worked out the details on that one yet. Um, so these are all animal life that are supported by microbial life that are powered by energy, chemicals, food coming from hydrothermal systems and are not dependent on the sun. And this was, again, a big discovery for the reasons I've already mentioned, but also in the context of astrobiology, uh, it changes where you think you might find life outside of Earth. So if you thought that life requires the sun, then your options are extremely limited in the solar system. 
if you think that life only requires volcanic activity, then you get a lot more options. And so what I want to talk about today is a hydrothermal system that is not a volcano and it has a different energy source and might further expand our options for life in the solar system. So the place where we've been studying this other kind of hydrothermal system is called the Lost City. It's the it's collection of chimneys um, near the top of this giant seafloor mountain called the Atlantis Massif. So the Lost City on the Atlantis Massif. Uh, discovered in 2000, mostly by accident. Uh, geologists were exploring the geology of the mountain and happened, were not expecting to find hot water coming out of chimneys and, and just came across it by watching the, the video feed. Uh, they were interested in the mountain because it's uh, not a volcano. Um, it's formed by this process called serpentinization and um, I feel really uncomfortable describing this slide <laughs> to this audience. This is, I am not a geologist, um, so my understanding is that serpentinization is the reaction by which the pretty green rock turns into the ugly black rock. Uh, for this audience, I'll leave it at that. Uh, for me, the important thing is that a byproduct of this is that it releases tons of hydrogen gas, and hydrogen gas is probably the best possible energy source for microbes. So if you have hydrogen gas, you're very likely to have life. Uh, um, but also makes very high pH fluids, which is challenging for life. And so those two things, basically free energy, but also extremely challenging biological environments, are the, is, the, is the tension that our research program on the site um, explores. Um, so here's a nice video of venting water from a lost city chimney. Uh, the pH, as I said, is high. Uh, in the site like this, it's about um, approaching pH 11. The water is hot, but not super hot, like a black smoker. So it's, um, this one is about 95 degrees Celsius, which is toasty, but well within the temperature limit of life. You know, some of the black smokers are way too hot for life. This is right in the temperature sweet spot for um, thermophilic microbes, especially because um, the 95 degree water obviously cools in millimeters away from the source of the fluid because it's venting into ice cold seawater. So you have every temperature in between 95 degrees and seven degrees. Um, when I was a grad student, um, I did some of the early work characterizing the microbes living in the chimneys. And we have pictures to show that there are microbes there. Um, we have yet to culture any of these organisms. So all of the work I'm gonna talk about today is without having the ability to grow any of these organisms in the lab. Uh, but we did some experiments and it's reasonable to suppose that they're probably being supported by all the hydrogen methane coming out of the chimneys. You don't really need a microscope to know that there are microbes um, living in these chimneys. You can just see with the video camera these snotty um, mucousy filaments growing all over the chimneys wherever you look. Here's a more zoomed in picture so you can see the filaments a little bit better. And when you pick up a sample of these carbonate chimneys, they're just coated in mucus. Like every available surface is totally covered in some biological gunk. So the microbes really like it there. The animals um, actually are there. And if you squint, you might be able to see some very tiny animals in this image. But for reasons that are still mysterious to the animal biologist, all the animals at Lost City are tiny. So I like to say that the, the animals are the microorganisms at the site and the bacteria and archaea are the macroorganisms because it's a lot easier to see microbes in this image than animals. Um, so but the big picture here is that this, um, this site at Lost City is not volcanic. Um, the, um, it's a bit of a complicated story. Uh, the geologists are still fighting about what the ultimate energy sources are for this site. But it's clear that the chemistry, at least, the, the parts of the system that the microbes interact with are completely dominated by serpentinization and the other reactions associated with serpentinization. The huge amounts of hydrogen, the high pH, that's all unique to a serpentinization-driven system. And so if this is a third type of way to support life, then that would really change um, the, it would open up more possibilities for life in the solar system because now you, not only do you not need sunlight, you don't need a volcanically and tectonically active planet. Maybe all you need is some undifferentiated rock and water. 
right? And that um, really opens up the possibilities. And we know that this almost certainly currently exists elsewhere in the solar system. Here's a shot of Enceladus and Moon of Saturn by the Cassini spacecraft. And what the astronomers think is going on is that they, these geysers emitting from the surface of Enceladus are caused by a hydrothermal system underneath the ice shell that is driven by serpentinization, so driven by oxidation and hydration of the ultramafic rock in the center of the moon. And when the astronomers are interpreting their remote sensing data from, from Enceladus, they use the, the little bits of uh, chemistry we know about Lost City as the kind of ground truthing calibration for their um, interpreting their measurements, because they think Lost City is probably the closest thing on Earth to Enceladus. So how can we study Lost City, this, this um, example of a serpentinization driven system on Earth to better understand how it's, better understand its relationship with life? And by understanding the system better, how can we understand what the possibilities for life elsewhere are? And so I've structured my talk according to three basic scientific questions that we're trying to address with the system. Um, who is living there? How are they doing it? And what, are the, what is their food? So that's the first part. Uh, and that is focused on the chimneys themselves. So um, the video I was showing is of these chimneys that are growing on top of the Atlantis Massif. But then that's just a tiny, tiny portion of the whole system. And so the second question is getting at uh, um, what does the rest of the system look like once you go away from the pretty chimneys? Who is living in the huge volume of rock that the chimneys sit on? And then third, uh, is this site unique? how applicable will the knowledge we gain from this one site be to understanding global or solar system level um, processes. Okay, so that's, that's the outline of my talk. I'll jump into question one. Am I talking loud enough? Any basic questions before I move on? So, what, how, how can we structure our exploration of the system? So what we know from the chemistry, as I've, I've hinted at so far, is that the carbon cycle is different than any other system that we know of on Earth. So one way of, of describing that is that organic carbon is very abundant at Lost City and inorganic carbon is rare. That is not how you would describe any other ecosystem on the planet except maybe like a landfill or a dumpster, right? <laughs> if you are a plant living out in the forest, CO2 is the primary carbon form and any kind of organic matter is, is very precious and everybody fights over it to eat it as fast as possible. At La City, you have millimolar levels of methane venting out of the chimneys that was apparently not consumed by anybody. Uh, in addition to methane, there's also micromolar levels of formate. So that's this single carbon uh, molecule here that is almost certainly produced by reduction of any CO2 in the system to formate. Um, so CO2 is rare in part because it gets reduced by hydrogen into formate. So formate is essentially the form that CO2 takes in a very reducing high pH system like this. But then also because of the high pH, any, other, any remaining CO2 gets precipitated out as carbonate and that's how you get the, the chimneys. So if you are an autotroph that needs CO2 to run your metabolism, you have a problem. There is no CO2 available. Maybe they, they get it from bicarbonate or they convert the carbonate into CO2, but anyway, they gotta figure out how to get CO2. And so our hypothesis for what we think is going on and that we use to write an NSF proposal is that there must be a, something else that connects the organic carbon produced by the rocks to the autotrophs that are what we as biologists normally think of as the first step in the ecosystem. So in order for carbon fixation, in order for CO2 fixation to occur, something needs to produce some CO2 because there's no CO2 otherwise. So we hypothesize some foundation species, maybe only one species that can do this, especially at high temperature and high pH because there are no uh, known examples of organisms that live at both high temperature and high pH. So there are organisms that can live at pH 12, there are organisms that can live at crazy high temperatures, but there is no example of an organism that is both hyperthermophilic and also hyperalkalophilic. And maybe that's just because we haven't ever gone to a place that has those combinations of conditions, or maybe it's a real biological limitation. So that's another question that we're addressing in this study. 
So this is, there are a million different questions that we could ask with a system, but this is the one that we put in the NSF proposal. It got funded, and so last year we were out at Lost City, and it was the first time uh, any American scientists anyway have been to that site since I was a grad student back in 2005. So it took us, um, so we went about 13 years without getting any samples from the site, and so we were really excited to get back there. Uh, we were out there with a team of about 20 scientists, about half of them were students, and of this relatively small team, we tried to cover as many uh, areas of science as possible, from genomics to viruses, to organic chemistry, and organic chemistry, mineralogy, etc. And we even had one artist on board. Our primary instrument was the um, ROV JSON. So that's the robot there that we use to collect all of our samples and collect all of our video. And JSON comes with its own team of, of nine full-time engineers who operate and, and maintain the robot. So here we are about almost exactly a year ago today on our way to Lost City. And um, we had four friends uh, coming out there with us, Florence, Joyce, Helen, and Isaac. Uh, the first time in 10 years that four storms were active at the same time, lucky us. And it turns out that captains of research vessels are very risk averse, and they are not going to sail into a hurricane in the name of science. And so we just hung out for several days dodging hurricanes until we actually got to, to, to go to Lost City and do our work. And, and they don't like tack on more days to compensate you for your weather days. Your, the, the port call is hard coded into the schedule. so. Instead of our scheduled 12 days, we got about five days of science days. So we just um, gave up sleep and worked around the clock and, and tried to collect as many samples as we could. But we got there. We, we got awesome video. This is um, one of our favorite uh, chimneys at Lost City. So you can see water bubbling up from underneath and spilling out the side because it's, um, hot water is, is more buoyant, so it, it floats up. You can see biofilms growing on the side of it. Um, and, and this video is also um, reminding me to say that the, the purpose of this project, I'm going to talk about other projects where we looked at rocks, for example, which you guys might be more interested in, but this project was focused on the water. So we wanted to sample the water um, in order to ask to investigate the, the questions I hinted at, because what we really want to know is who's in the subsurface. So in previous expeditions, when I was a grad student, we took chunks of the chimneys, and that's what I worked on, and so we have an idea of who lives in the chimneys. This project, we wanted to get really good samples of the water to infer who the microbes are living in the subsurface that accidentally get vented out. And so my longtime collaborator, Susan Lang, who has been working on Lost City with me ever since we were both grad students together at UW, she designed and built this water sampler um, specific for our expedition where um, uh, its, its cap capabilities include collecting huge amounts of water, and by huge, um, uh, about uh, 10 liters at a time, and about uh, uh, 12 of those. So it's only about 100 liters uh, per dive, which is not a huge amount of water. If <laughs> uh, you're used to working not on the seafloor, but on the seafloor, that's a huge amount of water. And um, the nozzle also has to be positioned very precisely. So what these videos are also showing is that um, the hydrothermal fluid mixes with the seawater continuously and immediately. And so our main methodological challenge in doing this kind of work is grabbing the water before it's mixed with much seawater. Right? And in order to do that, you got to put the nozzle in exactly the right spot. So that's what this video is showing is the highly skilled ROV pilot is positioning the nozzle in exactly the spot where we find the hottest, highest pH water. And they are really, really good at that. And we couldn't have done any, any science without their, their skills, yeah. Are you in contact with them, saying to the right, to the right, or are you yes. just, okay. And is there a delay on that, or is it uh, It's, the delay is astonishingly slow, especially because since this is on, on top of the mountain, it's the, the depth is not so great. It's only about 800, 800 meters. Um, yeah, so the delay is not so noticeable. Yeah, so we're all crowded in a room together, and I have a temperature readout that we use as our way of knowing whether he's in the right spot or not. And so I just call out temperatures, and as the temperature goes up, then he knows he's going in the right direction, and the temperature goes down, he knows to move. And that's what we spend basically all of our time doing. And nobody's <laughs> <laughs> there a lot of shouting. Uh, oh, usually the shouting occurs when there's a 
like the robot moves abruptly, accidentally, and the chimney falls down, gets knocked down. Um, it grows back really quickly, but yeah, it's always sad to see it. And you can see here how the nozzle has carved a little notch into the chimney here. So this stuff is pretty uh, fragile. It's really soft, yeah. The, the fresh stuff, um, when you bring it up to the surface, it's like cottage cheese. It's really, really, really soft. Yeah. And then as it ages, it gets more um, petrified. Mm. Um, so a thing that was new to this project is that we didn't just collect the water and bring it up, but we did that too. Um, we also used the sampler as an in situ experimental vessel. So for example, one thing we did was uh, inject C13 labeled um, compounds into these bags. And Julia here is holding up one of the bags that is installed on the sampler that goes down to the seafloor. Water comes into the bag, the water hits the C13 compound, and then if any microbes are in that water and are active and like to eat that compound, then hopefully they will eat it and incorporate it into their biomass, and then we can interrogate who ate what. Um, so this is our, one of the ways that we've tried to get around the idea, the, around the fact that we can't grow these things in the lab. So any information we're gonna get on their activity comes as soon as we collect them on the seafloor and before they get really stressed out that they're no longer on the seafloor. Mm -hmm. Yeah. How long do you let the labels So we, with this setup, we don't have a way of killing the experiment except by bringing it back up to the ship and then killing it. And so it essentially incubates for the entire time of the dive while it's on the seafloor, uh, which was like about 24 hours. But most, almost, Pretty likely all of the activity slows down to almost nothing within minutes, I'm guessing. I have absolutely no data on that yet. Because um, the bag is stored on the back of the robot and the, the robot doesn't go into the chimneys and so it's at about five degrees Celsius, the, the temperature of background seawater. And so it essentially goes into the refrigerator really quickly, about how long it takes for a few liters of water to cool down to background temperature. Mm. Um, so, yes, so we have various ways that we plan to uh, make use of these experiments, but it's all in progress because this is just a year ago. Um, two general strategies we are currently pursuing is to take the um, experiments with the C13 level compound, put it under a microscope with a Raman laser, and we, Julia has done a proof of concept experiment to show that yes, we can see individual cells that have more C13 than other cells. And then you can take optical tweezers and pick out that cell and say, I want to sequence the genome of that cell, or I want to sequence the genome of that cell. Um, it's extremely time consuming and tedious, and Julia needs to graduate, so I'm not actually sure when we're going to do that project, uh, which is nice that we have another approach for doing this uh, with our colleagues at the Bigelow Lab for Ocean Sciences in Maine, um, where they incubated it with a fluorescent uh, redox sensor compounds, so any microbes that were um, uh, undergoing, using redox chemistry, so any organism that was li alive will light up in a flow cytometer with the fluorescent signal, and then they can use a flow cytometer to automatically sort cells into a plate, and then we can sequence individual cells where one cell gets sorted into each plate. So that's essentially a more uh, automated version of this with a a less useful assay because this only tells us who was active, whereas this tells us exactly what it was eating when it was active. So that's why we also want to pursue that one. But this is the one that we are starting to get data from now. Um, so that's all in the future. And here's where I um, complain about we're still waiting on the data. So we wrote this proposal in 2013, submitted it in 2014, got funded in 2015, and then after you get the proposal funded, then it gets sent to a scheduling office, and the scheduling office will say, you're going in six months. And then a month before that, they will say, you're going in another six months. And then they'll say, another six months, and another six months, and another six months. And so if they told us that we weren't actually gonna go until 2018, then we could have planned accordingly, but of course they didn't do that. And so Julia, for example, kept waiting and expecting to go, and so it was nice that Brenda gave us another project to work on in the meantime. Um, otherwise, Julia would have been really bored, but um, 
uh, now, after our NSF project has ended, we have just got the samples and, and now Julie has to graduate. So in the meantime, though, we, we didn't want to just sit um, and do nothing on this project. And so we thought about how could we address this big hypothesis we have with the samples that we have in the freezer. Um, so before we went out last year to get new samples, Julia and I had been trying to learn as much as we could from the samples we have in the freezer. And so Susan, our collaborator, um, went to her freezer and was able to show that the formate molecules in the water, according to their C13 and C14 isotopes, are definitely from the mantle. So their C14 dead, the C13 is consistent with it being from the mantle. And the portions, but not all of the biomass in the chimneys, also have a C13 and C14 signature that matches that of the formate, indicating that they must be building their biomass from formate. And therefore, we have direct evidence of microbes that are building themselves from carbon from the mantle, which is pretty cool. No one has ever shown that before. It's been, it's kind of makes sense. So it wasn't totally surprising, but it was very satisfying that we could show that it actually works. And then with the genomic data, we looked at the genes that are involved in metabolizing formate. And to my surprise, it was actually consistent with our hypothesis that the genes for formate are not widely distributed and only a few species can do it. And the autotrophs that we normally think of as the base of the ecosystem actually can't metabolize formate, even though there's no reason why they couldn't. We looked and looked and looked and none of them could use the formate. So really, this is not an example of like re-engineering our hypothesis to fit the data. We were really shocked that the data was consistent, that there must be some other organism that was using the formate, and then the autotrophs that we normally think of as the base of the ecosystem de are dependent on those organisms. Um, uh, so really quickly, how we do this um, without having live organisms is that we just sequence DNA from the sample. So just to make clear, this is not uh, having peachy plates and like picking colonies. We really grind up the rock, or we just filter the water and sequence DNA straight from the sample. And we get a bunch of random DNA fragments and spend the rest of our time in front of our computers trying to do uh, multiple, and by multiple I mean thousands of jigsaw puzzles in parallel to finally come up to a final result where you can say that you have this pot of genes that even if we haven't assembled it into a nice circular genome, we know that this pot of genes should belong to one organism, this is a different organism, and this is a different organism. And you have a collection of genes that approximate an organism uh, that's by connection. And so our three favorite organisms from doing this kind of work that Julia has are these guys. And these two, for example, are ones that can use formate. And this is a figure to show that she did a lot of work to figure out the whole metabolic pathway. And our basic idea is that formate comes out. This guy and maybe that guy convert the formate to something like CO2, that this methanogen that we previously thought was the primary player in the ecosystem can use to make methane. So that's how we made a little bit of progress on the project in the meantime. And to remind her, this is the, the experiment that will tell us whether these DNA sequences are actually reflecting the reality of what happens when you do a, a metabolic activity experiment to see what they're actually doing. Because as you've probably heard a million times, DNA never tells you what they're actually doing. It just tells you what they might be capable of. This experiment will tell us what they might have been actually doing on the seafloor. Do you have so, a question? Yes, there is a little bit that the, the surrounding seawater is fully oxygenated. And oh. so um, part of the uh, motivation behind drawing the diagram this way is Julia put this guy kind of on the interface between the fluids and seawater because there are some uh, uh, um, gibberish on this figure indicating that it can use oxygen as an electron acceptor potentially. This guy cannot use oxygen as an electron acceptor. It must be doing something else. And its genes indicate that it's probably, I should stop touching my computer, I think. Um, doing something like acetogenesis uh, where the electron acceptor is essentially formate. So it's actually reducing formate with, with something else. But yeah, Julia's paper is 
trying to answer that question in detail, and we, one way of saying is we don't know exactly. But it's definitely anaerobic. Mm. Um, yeah, so that's the first part of the talk. Um, we, have a we have a little bit of insight into who the organisms are, what they might be doing, and we're awaiting data on what they're actually doing. Any other questions about that? Mm. Second part is what's happening away from lost city. So again, all that data I showed you is just from chunks of chimney that we grabbed. The new data that I'm excited about is from the water that's coming out of the chimneys. Um, and now what I'm going to tell you about is a project where we looked at what's happening in the rocks that are more representative of the massif in general and probably more representative of the seafloor in general. So this was an IODP drilling project um, in 2015 where we went out to the Atlantis Massif and drilled a bunch of holes into the surface of the mountain. Uh, we used uh, seabed rock drills, so the, it was not a drill riser ship, it was not the Dirty's Resolution. It was two different uh, seabed robots, basically, that um, <coughs> just uh, punched tiny little cores into the surface. So they were designed for doing uh, coastal sediment work, and this is the first time they'd ever been used in hard rock, and they basically didn't work. <laughs> Uh, like we all expected. Um, but the way we justified uh, the project, even though everybody was pretty sure the drills wouldn't work very well, is that the, a feature of the seabed rock drills is that anything they are capable of drilling, they recover really well. So um, we only got a total of 57 meters of core, which is a tenth of what the proposal said we would do. But of the 57 meters, um, like 90% of it was nicely recovered. So. We only got a little bit, but the little bit that we got was really nice. Uh, each core, like 57 meters is the total among all of the cores. So each core was really shallow. So we're only talking about the top couple of meters of the mountain, which really limits the amount of inference we can do about the mountain as a whole. But it's, it's what we have to work with. Um, and it being an IODP project, there was a lot of people on board um, of all scientific disciplines and a lot of subsampling of, of the cores. Um, here's a picture of one of my favorite cores, and you can see how there's some uh, solid rock, and next to the solid rock, we often or occasionally got this greenish, black, mushy um, uh, pebbles, and um, yeah, not quite sand, but it, like mushy um, pebbles, um, which is really cool, because you can imagine microbes living there, right? It's hard to imagine microbes living in solid rock, but that, um, that you can imagine microbe living in. So I'll talk more about that. Um, yeah, I just said that. There's a lot of people, big project. Um, so in addition to the rocks, um, so while the engineers were fixing the broken rock drills, we spent the rest of our time collecting water samples, which the geologists thought was really weird because this is a drilling cruise, but we are like, what else are we going to do? So we collected water samples in part as just simple boring contamination control because the cores are going to be contaminated with seawater, but also as a more general oceanographic uh, project to ask whether the mountain is affecting the seawater above it. So that's why we did that. Um, a little bit more on the contamination issues. So when the um, a, a core is successfully drilled and it's stored on the robot, then it just sits on the seafloor for the time of the dive until that drilling uh, activity is finished and it comes back to the ship. And they aren't sealed in any real way on the seafloor, so they're being bathed in seawater for the entire time after they've been collect after they've been drilled until they get to the ship. So they're going to be seawater bacteria on the cores. Um, and then all of the usual contamination you would get from bringing them onto the ship. And so we collected a lot of water samples, and we also collected samples of the various kinds of lubricants and greases and oils that are on the rock drills themselves. And undergrad in the lab, Lizette um, evaluated various options for extracting and sequencing the DNA from the oils. Um, and she also extracted all of the, extracted DNA from all the water samples. So we, we really, this is, one of a long series of things I'm about to tell you of how we tried to address the issue of contamination into the rock cores, because we knew that these rock cores were not going to have thick, gunky biofilms growing all over them. If we were going to detect life in them, we would have to prove that it was not contamination. Um, so after we collected the rocks, we then flew them immediately to Japan, to the Kochi Institute for Core Sample Research, where they have a specialized facility for dealing with this sort of thing. 
Um, for example, a microbiologically clean rock saw uh, that ha um, has no uh, lubricant. It, it keeps the, the saw from overheating by just keeping it uh, cool. So it's really cold in that room. Um, it's inside a, um, a very clean room. Uh, it's, in, it's inside a, um, a closet, which is inside a clean room. They did everything they could possibly do to keep it as clean as possible. And so then we, we sawed the outer layer of each rock core off so that the sample that we analyzed was hopefully pristine and anything that had previously been exposed to the surface had been sawed off. So that was one thing that we did. Um, here's a, an example of a serpentinite. And uh, again, there's an example of a nice intact piece that's been sawed off, the exteriors have been sawed off and associated with it is also this rubble. Um, and the rubble, we couldn't really saw in section in this way, so all the rubble we just washed in, in milky water before, we, before it went on to crushing. Um, we crushed everything by hand with mortars and pestles. I researched a lot of options, and this is the best way we could ensure that it would be clean. And so we just used the magic of grad student labor. Uh, I, I did a lot of crushing too. Uh, crushed all the samples and then subsampled them into a million different vials and shipped them off to everybody involved in the project. Uh, so our, we got one uh, significant but small fraction of all of the samples, came back to Utah, and Sherry was tasked with trying to figure out how to get DNA out of rocks. So um, this was almost certainly harder than squeezing blood from a stone is squeezing DNA from a stone. And she spent uh, years um, coming up with a protocol and it worked. Um, so some of the things that she did was convert a supply closet in our lab into a clean room. We didn't have the funds for building a real clean room, but we did the best we could by filtering the air and sealing it off and getting a dust monitor. Um, she filtered the air in our lab and sequenced the DNA from our lab air and um, came up with a new DNA protocol that you guys probably don't care about, but it's um, new, no one has ever done something quite like this before, and it was extremely labor intensive. Um, uh, it took three days to process one sample, working 11 hours a day, um, and it, we processed 40 grams of each rock, which for molecular biology work is a gigantic amount of sample, and we had to do that in order to get enough DNA to work with. And by we, of course, I mean Sherry. So it worked. She got sequences, and that, that already is a huge success. Um, here is a uh, one of the ways that we microbiologists like to summarize our data. So each data point is one sample, summarizing the microbial composition of that sample in relation to other samples. So here are our deep and shallow seawater samples, and here are surface samples, which are just buckets that um, we threw over the side of the ship. And so um, first result is that water samples are significantly different than rock samples, yay. If that were not true, then <coughs> that would be awkward. What you can also see here, though, is that our, by our Sherry's samples of our lab air are overlapping with our serpentinite rock samples. So that is an early indication that our primary source of contamination is air, but a more optimistic way of saying it is that we succeeded in removing water as a primary source of contamination. Uh, this is another way of looking at essentially the same data, but this time it's um, quantifying the proportion of sequences in each sample, so these are different serpentinite samples, and these are the proportions of the sequences in each sample that we could assign to the different sources of contamination. So water is very small source of contamination, so all of that work we did to control for contamination seems to have worked. The drill oil that Lizette managed to get DNA out of is also a very small source of contamination, so uh, another success. And here, as we saw in the previous plot, air is really the primary source of contamination. The gray bars are not a known contaminant, which means maybe it's real, maybe it's really from the rock. Like with this type of analysis, all we can say is that it's not a known contaminant. Um, so again, I, uh, Sherry was really disappointed to see there's so much air contamination, but my optimistic interpretation was that's because we eliminated contamination from all the other sources. So what Sherry's working on now is now that we know what the sources of contamination are, what do we do with that information? How do, we, how do we eliminate those contaminant sequences? And that is a conceptually simple, but it turns out methodologically difficult problem because um, 
saying with certainty this sequence out of a million sequences is a contaminant and these are not contaminants it has very poor statistical power. And it's, it's just a really challenging statistical and molecular biology problem. And uh, she worked on it a long time and I think we have results that show real rock inhabiting microbes. But um, uh, it's a complicated story and so I'll let Sherry give it, um, she's giving a seminar in biology later this, this semester. So you should come to her talk. I think what I'd like to talk about in this talk though is, um, first of all, how difficult it was just to get to the point where Sherry could get her hands on the rocks. I took um, probably 10 years of my life to get working on this project before Sherry could actually work with the samples. So these big interdisciplinary and international projects take a lot of time um, and the publications are just now coming out, but there will be a, um, more to come. But what I'd like to talk about now is how this, working on this project and constantly thinking about contamination, honestly I think contamination is one of the most boring issues one could work on in microbial ecology. It's just not intellectually stimulating, right? It's a methodological problem. It's not a scientific concept. But the more I thought about it, the more I realized that it's actually central to microbial ecology. So let me explain what I mean by that. Um, every uh, habitat on the planet has a uh, diversity distribution of its microbes that looks like this, which we call the, the long tail of the rare biosphere. So if you line up all the species in a habitat, it doesn't matter what it is, it could be seawater, it could be soil, it could be rock, it could be my finger, you have a very small number of very abundant species. So these are very abundant species and they're very small, very few of them. And then you have an unknown number of extremely rare species. And this long tail, we call it, as far as we can tell, with all of the sequencing power we have is infinite. It never goes to zero. Um, so we don't know how many species there are in any one habitat. It could be thousands, it could be millions, it could be billions for all we can tell. Um, and when this first happened, of course, the first uh, interpretation was, well, it's because this new fancy sequencing technology is spitting out crap. Uh, that is true, but even if, after you account for the crap, it does seem real. So. What does that mean? Are they just contaminants? What does contaminants mean? Are these active microbes or are they just dormant? Are they just hanging out? Are they just passing through? Are they um, going to become abundant soon or were they already abundant and now they're um, fallen stars? What, how, do, how do we interpret this information? And when we make plots like this one, where we quantify how similar or different whole communities of microbes are, what we're really doing is saying, how different is this graph from that graph? If this is one sample, this is a second sample. Use some kind of metric to say this is 33% similar to that one or whatever, right? That's pretty easy and it's usually pretty boring. And what we really want to be able to do is say, what is the significance of finding a species that is abundant in this sample but not abundant in the sample? Does that mean that it's contamination? Does it mean that, that that species dispersed from one site to the other? And you might notice that this didn't change when I changed the word from contaminant to dispersal, because it's really the same thing, right? Contamination is just one special case of dispersal. And if we do find such a thing, how do we know in which direction it went? Can we just assume it went from the abundant one to the rare one? Does that make any sense? And then more generally, if we do this for all of the species and all of the samples and all of the locations and all of the time points, does this add up to a record of dispersal and maybe other ecological events? Is this a record of past events that led up to the point in time where you collected the sample? And if that is true, if that is how we can use this information, then there's a ton of information in this long tail. And we can do a lot more with it than we are currently doing, which is just making those silly uh, MDS plots where we say that rocks are different than water. Right. There's a lot more information in there if we know how to work with it. So that's why I wanted, that's kind of the unifying framework I wanted to use to describe how I keep getting involved in so many projects. So th this is why I like working on so many projects is because all of these projects are that same conceptual problem. And the more, my hope is the more projects I work on, the better I will be able to think about that conceptual problem. So thanks to the Utah project, I got invited to st sample the Red Butte Creek, where we can say the upper canyon is different than the lower canyon. Okay, like that's not surprising. But what we can also do is 
track individual species and say that it's only abundant in one spot or two spots, but we find it at, in rare abundances in other spots. So does that mean we can actually say that it is traveling along those locations, but only blooming when it hits a certain spot? Uh, another project from a more medical uh, angle, looking at antibiotic resistance in urban rivers, looking at whether uh, how dispersal of microbes from these different sources get concentrated in a wastewater treatment plant and then get further dispersed. Uh, collaborated with someone uh, in my department looking at canopy soil in trees and dispersal of microbes between the canopy and the forest floor. Same undergraduate student Cody Dangerfield looked at microbes in decomposing cow carcasses out in the West Desert, uh, looking at dispersal between different cow carcasses. Uh, uh, thanks to Bill Johnson, I got to work in the Great Salt Lake. Bacterial species, <coughs> that's what we have so far. And of those 25% of them, we found at least one of these other sites on land. Right? And that, I was honestly shocked by that number. I was expecting a, like, a few, and then we'd have to scratch our heads about whether that was contamination in the lab. But 25% was a huge number. I was really surprised by that. And so, how does that happen? So, my favorite idea is that it's microbial dispersal of biotech tectonics. 
So as these rocks get moved around the planet, the microbes probably tag along for the ride. Um, um, I know that the rocks experience pretty extreme conditions and probably kill all the life inside them, but maybe they have a way of surviving until they get to their, their site with the continents. Um, anyway, it's an idea I really like. But there's obviously a much easier explanation, which is that the ocean just carries them around and then they get aerosolized in the water or something like that. So I actually have some data that pertains to that possibility. Um, and that comes from these water samples that we collected that I mentioned at the beginning. So bringing this whole circle back to this project, um, this IED project where we collected the rocks. We also collected a bunch of water and it's in the rocks in the ship. And um, it turns out those water samples were more interesting than we were expecting. So again, we only initially collected them as a contamination control. But as we looked at those water samples, um, there were some surprises. So now here's a topo map of the sea floating down on it. This is approximately where Los City is. And these numbers are hydrogen concentrations, and the water samples, um, uh, uh, in some cases, a few meters above the bottom, up to maybe 100 meters above the bottom. So these are nanomolar, pretty low, but um, background seawater essentially at zero. Hydrogen is like a very small number. The plume is not the chimneys themselves, but a water sample collected very close to the chimneys, so it's 266 nanomolar. And the surprise is that even a few kilometers, and this is about like 10, 15 kilometers away from the lost city, there's still detectable levels of hydrogen. And the chemists spent a lot of time trying to make sure that their methods were right and they were generating hydrogen somewhere, but they think that this is real. And the hydrogen is much more expansive than they thought. It's really hard to explain how you get that much hydrogen if the only source of hydrogen is this one point source of the lost city chimneys here. So there must be water coming out of the sea from other places than just the lost city. And so I looked at the DNA sequences in these water samples and asked, is the rare tail, the rare sequences in these water samples, are they more likely to come from the water next to the chimneys, or is it more likely to come from boring background seawater with the fish? And again, that is what this is, 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 is um, trying to infer something quantitative by looking at patterns among shared rare numbers of the microbes. Because using only the bundle microbes, you never find anything. So you have to use the rare microbes. So this is the results. This is using the same approach that I showed earlier for quantifying the different sources of contamination in the rock cores that I showed earlier. Now we're quantifying the different sources of metallic contamination if you want. Does it really matter? But different sources. The sources are the lost station and plume, and that's what we talked about. The water and the chimneys, or site 74, which is this one, which is as far as we can tell, going back on sea water. And to my surprise, even these samples way down here, most of the sequences can be traced to hydrothermal. Uh, water rather than boring background seawater water. Um, we, the, the, the currents, the ocean currents on the top of the sea are, are, are complicated and unpredictable, but in general, it kind of goes from north to south and it kind of goes like this. So this actually makes sense that these have more background seawater on um, these guys if the background seawater is kind of going this way and the humans are going to this way. But still, I didn't expect that strong reason. And then another surprising thing from this is that a sample out here is completely gray, which means neither of those sources seemed likely in this analysis from that site. So when I look at the names of the microbes in that site, they all have um, prefixes like sulfo and methano. And so even if you don't know anything about microbiology, that those are not normal seawater microbes. So we think there's something else going on at that site. And then something else going on at that site that we that is not the same as what's going on last week. So maybe a different vent system, or our preferred hypothesis is that there's some um, diffuse venting going out on the flanks of the mountain that might be a more diffuse version of the So that might be our, our next proposal for our project. Okay, so I wanted to mention that as kind of a thing that ties all those projects together. Um, the answer is 
um, microbes are globally dispersed, and we can actually trace the microbes dispersing from Lost City into the, into the ocean. Um, uh, yeah, and so, so the question there is, so yeah, we find them getting carried out over here. So the next question is, so once they get out here, what are they doing? Is, are they screwed at that point? Now they just got to wait for 10,000 years until ocean currents randomly bring them back to Lost City? Or are they continuing to be metabolically active out there in the water column? And since we know that there is measurable hydrogen, maybe there's actually um, chemoautotrophy going on in the water column as a, kind of extending the biogen chemical footprint of the serpentization system of the right. So that, that's why I wanted to that, um, that the influence of velocity might be felt in more of the ocean than Okay, that's it. Uh, yes, we have life. We don't know exactly what it's doing, but it seems to be getting around the globe. It's the punchline. And I thought, especially since I'm giving a talk in the College of Mines, I should end with this. Um, so a few years ago, UNESCO proposed Lost City as a World Heritage Site as part of its initial push to get international um, uh, marine sites, so marine locations outside the jurisdictions of any one nation to be recognized as UNESCO World Heritage Sites. Currently, there is actually no legal mechanism for designating something outside of a national jurisdiction as special protection status. Um, but for these reasons of scientific importance, it's natural beauty and so on, this is one of the five initial um, international marine sites proposed by the UN. And shortly after that, another body of the UN, the International Seabed Authority, uh, granted rights to Poland to explore the portion of seafloor, including the last city, for mining. And so when I first heard this, I thought it must have been a mistake. It's like someone got all that long mixed up. Like, why did anybody even want to do that? Um, but no, it's real. Um, they, Poland, as far as I know, is down there exploring the seafloor for mining. And so this was a wake-up call to the scientific community. We all thought this was all science fiction and nobody was seriously considering this, but um, it's happening now. Nobody is actually mining, so this is just for mining exploration, not actually mining itself. Um, so any actual mining is many years down the road, but the processes are getting put into place for this time. And you guys, I'm sure, know the reasons for this. It's that we need batteries. The seafloor is honestly probably a good place to look for it. But the way that they're going about it is just kind of insane and has no input from the public or scientists and no accountability at all. The environmental impact statements have no standards and don't be public. And so it's um, stimulated the grassroots effort of uh, nonprofits and scientists to get involved and try to um, affect how this process develops. So that's, um, I never expected that my research at Lost would lead me to something so practical. One of the things I like about that line of research is that it's so alien and different from everything I normally mean, interact with in daily life, so I was really surprised that it um, intersected with these answers. So now when I get interview requests for our Lost City project, it's just as likely to be about this as for the science, which is kind of sad, but that's okay. <laughs> oh yeah, lots of people think these are all, all these projects are highly collaborative, so great to make people to mention. But especially like to thank all the students in my lab and the velocity crews, and uh, especially since we have a long time for our day who ran that project. Okay, I've talked long enough. Sorry, thanks. <laughs>